Welcome to the Colorado Trial Lawyer Connection, where Colorado trial lawyers share insights from their latest cases. The pursuit of justice starts now. Well, welcome back, everyone. I am Keith Fuselli, and we are thrilled to host another episode of the Colorado Trial Lawyer Connection. And our whole goal of this podcast is to help Colorado trial lawyers learn from people that are in the trenches, in the arena, fighting the battles, what worked, what didn't work, and uh, hopefully get a little bit of inspiration along the way. And with that, I am thrilled to have John Duguay here to talk about an amazing, a truly amazing result on a difficult case in a difficult venue with lots of difficult circumstances. So with that, welcome to the show, John. Thanks, Keith. Thanks so much for having me. And I always like, before we jump in and talk about the case, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Have you always known you wanted to be a trial lawyer? No. Uh, you know, I, my origin story, I, I think I always had, there was some a long history of maybe I want to be a lawyer. And that dates back to my mom used to tell me a story of when I was born that her mom said, John, John James Duguay, that sounds like an attorney's name. And so it does. So <laughs> like, that seed was planted early on that maybe this is something that I might be interested in, uh, but never really came to it until I was in undergrad studies. I took a business law class and I just really connected with the professor which got me interested in, again, maybe i try this law thing. And then I went to the, do an, uh, an internship at the public defender's office. Oh, and great. That spurred trial advocacy as an interest. And I, I think I always had this idea of sticking up for the little guy and sticking it to the man and being, you know, for the underdog. Uh, and so at first that was uh, maybe criminal law is the avenue for me. Um, and I did some work there, but I had some moral questions about some of the people I was representing doing criminal law. Uh, and I had the opportunity to, when I moved to Colorado, start at uh, Bacchus and Schenker. Huh. And, and it was kind of a, here's a job that's available to me type of thing. But starting there, I, I grew a real passion for it. Yeah. And you know, I learned a lot from Kyle and Darren and, and their passion for the practice really inspired me and kind of led me down a long road to where I am today. But that was uh, back in 2016 when I first started back, started there. That's great. And I don't know if you know this, but I also worked for Darren and Kyle a long time ago when they were when they were smaller. But I agree it was wonderful to have them as mentors, honestly, because they are both very passionate about trying cases the right way. And one of the takeaways to their credit that I carry with me to this day was never skimp on expenses when you're taking a case to trial. It's in for a penny, in for a pound. And that has always stuck with me and been fortunate enough to be able to have the resources to try cases the right way now. So it's amazing how having people with sort of the right attitude on how to go forward with cases can influence your future. And so here you are now, tell us a little bit about the case that we're here to chat about. Yeah, so um, the case, this is a case for my client, Paul Daw, and um, it's a, an interesting case, a, a tough case that a lot of the issues that we see pop up in, in cases over and over again were issues in this case. And I came into the case to help try the case about a month before trial. Wow. And so immediately wanted to get up to speed to get to know Paul, get to know what the issues were in the case. And it was a um, collision that happened in Thornton. The at fault driver was a young girl, 17 year old, had a car full of kids uh, that she probably should not have had in her car given the restrictions on her license at the time. Uh, but she she turned left in front of Paul. Paul's going straight. She turns left going into a gas station, and it was a big, forceful crash. So thankfully, that was one of the things that we didn't have to deal with in this case. It wasn't a situation of um, low visible property damage. There was great crash pictures in terms of you could look at the pictures and understand 
very easily that someone could be hurt in this crash. Okay. So, and, and Paul did not go, he, he was only a few blocks from home. And so he decided to just go home that night and try to go to sleep on his couch. Uh, but the next morning woke up in a lot of pain and went to the, the emergency room. And he had injuries, pain in his low back, his neck, his shoulder, his knee, um, had some concussive mild TBI symptoms. And thankfully, most of his injuries resolved with conservative care, with some chiropractic and physical therapy. But the remaining injury was his low back injury. And ultimately, after going through multiple rounds of Cairo, PT, yeah. he um, eventually gets referred to Josh Johnston, who I know many people are familiar with, who may be listening to this, who's a great chiropractor, but also has expertise in injury biomechanics and accident yep. reconstruction. Yep. And Dr. Johnston recognized early on, I'll do what I can to help you, but I think this may be surgical. There may not be anything we can do for you. Okay. And then down the road gets sent to Dr. Jack Rentz for injections. And again, Dr. Rentz echoes the same sentiment of Dr. Johnston, looking at the imaging, hearing what's going on with Paul. Try these injections for you, but I think you may end up needing a surgery. Okay. And he ultimately gets seen by Dr. Jacob Rumley. And Dr. Rumley does some more evaluations and some more testing, but says, ultimately, the only thing I can do for you is a lumbar fusion, a multi-level lumbar fusion. And let me, let me jump in. How old was your client when the crash occurred? 38. Wow. Okay. And you mentioned a lot of pre-existing issues. Did, did your client have prior low back issues? Yes. And when I say a lot, maybe that's not fair. So he, okay. what we learned is that he had, in high school, a uh, football injury where he had a lumbar, an L4 fracture as a result of that. Wow. And he, okay. didn't, he didn't actually know until we're preparing for trial, really, as he's reviewing the expert reports in this case and talking through it with him. Oh, that injury I had in high school led to a, a lumbar fracture. He just knew I hurt my back and I was in a back brace for a day or a few days. Uh, but eventually those symptoms subsided. And then so did they catch the they catch the fracture because of subsequent MRIs related to your case. They saw like evidence of a healed fracture and you put two and two together that that occurred in the football injury. That's exactly right. Wow. So it, right. All we had in the case was this is an old fracture. We can we see okay. it's an old fracture. here. And but he didn't know prior to having this imaging done in this case. Now, then fast forwarding from the football injury, in the five years before our crash, he had gone to the to his doctors at Kaiser twice and reported flare-ups of his low back pain. And what he said was, uh, one time back in 2016, I was helping a friend move and this flared up. He went to his doctor, said, this happens every once in a while where it flares up for a couple days. I'm having a flare up right now. And the doctors, you know, gave him some pain meds and said, come back and see us again. That's a problem. Never came back after that. Okay. Um, and then he had another flare up a couple of years later where he ended up asking his doctor for a note to cancel a flight because he was in back pain and didn't want to get on a plane the next day. Now, how, how long that, I mean, that seems kind of like a big deal. How long before the crash was that note? So that was just about two years before the crash. Wow. And, and preparing for trial, you know, come to find out from the clients that this was less of an issue of his back bothering him and more of them having some other plan that came up and of looking, course. <laughs> looking for a way to get out of the, of course. But right. Um, right. And so we had to be careful with how to present that. Um, and you know, we just sort of own what's in the records. Look, I was having a flare up of my back pain, but it was temporary. Um, and then there's no sign of any other treatment for the, there's about almost an entire two year clean period of no mention of any back pain. And so, but obviously the defense trying to make as big deals possible out of, this is a pre-existing injury. 
reviewing the fence had hired Dr. Saban um, as their yes. expert who I have some familiarity with. I find him to be pretty reasonable. Um, same, same. But, and, and taking a look, you know, one of the things that Darren taught me early on was you got to really assess what is the expert's opinion. And in this case, Dr. Saban's opinion was not that Paul didn't need surgery. It was, I don't see the evidence in the record of what I've reviewed to support Dr. Rumley's recommendation for surgery. And so, you know, that immediately got me thinking, okay, what hasn't he reviewed? And what are, what are the things I can point to of maybe you just don't have complete information. Did um, Saban examine your client? Exact. So that's one key thing. Never laid hands on the client. Wow. Okay. Never examined them. The other key thing, he never looked at the actual imaging. He only looked at the imaging reports. And wow. so, so very early on in uh, the by cross of Dr. Sabin, I was able to say, look, any if you're ref now he Sabin now only really does these forensic evaluations. I don't think he's really seeing patients anymore. But talking with him, I heard that I heard that recently that he's retired or he had some medical condition that I think maybe prevents him from doing surgery. I'm not sure if that's accurate, I, but I think that's right. It doesn't have a, okay. some lack of stability in his hands or something that he's not okay. doing surgeries anymore. But um, you know, talk with him. Look, when if you're going to recommend one of your patients for surgery, what are the things you make sure you do every time? Well, I am going to meet with them. I'm going to assess you know, how they present, how they uh, describe their symptoms, what they look like and feel like. And of course, I'm going to look at the imaging and, and make my own assessment of the imaging. And so right. I was really able to um, dissect his, starting with what is his opinion? His opinion is I don't have enough information to support the recommendation for surgery. Well, you didn't see the patient and you didn't look at the imaging. And those are two things you would do in every single case where you're going to refer your own patient for surgery. And so could that be the missing information you don't have here? That's the missing link between Dr. Rumley's recommendation for surgery and you saying you don't see it. And well, one of the thing, one of the things I love about that, what I like to do in that situation as well is point out that these doctors are relying upon the defense to right. get them the information that they need to make an informed opinion. So when you have this gift that you're given, like it sounds like you were in your case, you turn it on the defense team in terms of them dropping the ball, getting the expert what they need. That's right. beautiful. Yeah. And the other thing with Dr. Sabin is that he, he said in his report, he saw no evidence of radiculopathy or any radicular symptoms. Yes. And then I, of course, found 20 different references in chiropractic records that he just overlooked of numbness and tingling in the hands. And so I, one by one, is that evidence of radiculopathy? Is that evidence of radiculopathy? And Let me ask you about that. Did he, sorry to interrupt you, but did he concede that? Cause I've gotten, sometimes I've gone down this road and I've had experts try to wiggle out of, well, yeah, there's numbness and tingling, but that's not true radiculopathy. It needs to be radiating all the way down from the neck, down the arm. And if it's not radiating down the arm, et cetera, it's not radiculopathy. So I'm curious whether or not Dr. Sabin, did he just sort of concede that that was radiculopathy or did you approach it more? This record says numbness and tingling. This record says numbness and tingling and leave it at that. So you're right. And he did try to toe that line a little bit to say that's not necessarily radiculopathy, but the way that he, I was able to lock him into, there's no evidence of numbness and tingling. And numbness and tingling can be evidence of radiculopathy and sort of, not that it necessarily was, but I, I set that up to say, these are one of the things you could look for if you're looking for radicular symptoms. And you say there's nothing to support the finding any radicular symptoms. And then setting it up that way, going through, okay, here's all these instances of numbness and tingling, not saying for sure that is radiculopathy, but saying it, it supports um, that there could have been radiculopathy going on at that time. Uh, and he had to concede that. So I had to kind of had to put it in a way where he didn't, wasn't able to wiggle out of it based on that framing. Yeah, that's that. 
What I love about what you just said is you, you talk about the framing of it, and this is something you thought about in advance. So this was sort of your plan on how to deal with him at trial. Yeah. So, and I have to give all the credit to Josh Johnston on this. Mm. And, and this is one of my um, things that I took from this case. I mean, Josh was an all-star both in how he presented at trial and in helping me prepare for trial um, okay. because he really educated me on the language of, okay, you have to be careful with how you talk about this because he he let me know Saban will try to wiggle out of that uh just like you just said and mm -hmm. so he really helped me prepare for how to ask the questions in a way that Saban couldn't wiggle out of and you know just helping me understand the science in a way that I could explain it the other thing that Josh was great um is he Josh looked at the imaging and Josh you know talked to the radiologist and and all of you know, the Sabin and the defense position was what we see on the MRI is just this old fracture and just degeneration of the spine and nothing acute, no acute injury caught that is shown on the imaging. Now, the doctor they're relying on to say that hadn't actually looked at the imaging. And so, you know, they kind of, oh. they set that up for me where it was pretty easy to then put together with Josh that looking closer at the imaging, there was evidence of a disc extrusion is what he called it. And so, wow. and, and Josh really, you know, helped again, help me with look at the imaging of an Oreo where if the disc sort of pushing down and it's causing a herniation, you expect this sort of even, um, extruding or, or protruding. Yes. Uh, surfaces on the discs there, but there was a, a, a more obvious um, extrusion at L4 that Josh was able to colorize the images and get up during his testimony and point that out. Um, and was so, it one side? Was that, was that extrusion more prominent to one side? Yes. Uh, actually, I think it was in, in the front. It was, no, it was on the left side, I believe. So Okay. Yeah. Cause there is just just so our listeners know, because I've had this come up before, there is um, a peer reviewed article that talks about how degenerative bulges and degenerative disc issues tend to be uh, they're not they're bilateral. They're not unilateral to one side. So when you have a situation with an extrusion or a protrusion to one side, that can be evidence that it's traumatic in nature versus degenerative. And that brings me to another question I had with your client's prior back injuries. Am I correct in assuming there were no prior MRIs of his lumbar spine from way back when? Correct. And I okay. I think there may have been, but we didn't have it. It was yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. And so hard to say whether we benefited from there not being prior imaging or not. But so some a couple of the things that I jumping in on this case from in the trial prep phases that that I learned or that I that sort of solidified these things these ideas for me um, that things I've been told and hear about but see it all put into practice um, and one was you have to think take a step back and think why are we still right you know why Keith Metnick the why right. the power of the why why are we and, right and why are they wrong and I I am a big Mitnick fanboy and a lot of the phrases that he uses and I, I've taken from him. I just went to his art of outsmarting conference in California, which was great. Um, but I, you know, I borrowed a lot. I, we, we all sort of stand on the shoulders of those who have come before us and I, I you know, we'll get to it more, but I have you to thank and, and other um, contributors to the listserv, you know, to thank for a lot of ideas that I got in this trial. And I think it's really important what you're doing here with this podcast, sort of sharing these ideas and hopefully inspiring people, getting people to think, well, if it's, he did it, you know, maybe I can do it too. Uh, Cause For sure. I can tell you, there's certainly nothing special about me um, that I was able to do this. And, and I think, you know, that's sort of, it's within anyone's capabilities and getting back to the, the whys of why, why is this important? You know, why am I right anyways? Well, and another mitnickism here was the sensible sequence of events of, 
you know, and, and the client, Paul, went from, okay, he had two mentions of back pain within a 20-year period to then 180 visits mentioning his low back pain following this crash. And so, again, another mitnickism, like, is it all just a coincidence that that he now has it went from having back pain once in a while would flare up when he would lift heavy stuff but go away in a couple days to now back pain that has never gone away that is always at this five six out of pain and never getting better is that a coincidence or is that because of this big car crash that he was in and you know thinking about that as a a framing that's why we're still right we're still right because we forget what the mri showed he didn't have this kind of pain he didn't have yeah. this kind of problem uh prior to the crash and he had consistent reports of this pain and these problems after the crash so you've got a surgical recommendation and the client did not do the surgery is that right yes and so uh how much was, how, how did you go about for our listeners? How did you price out that future surgery? And why was it that your client did not get the surgery? So we had Acumed. Okay. Yes. Um, yep. And they priced out the surgery for us. Um, and they're great. I highly recommend them. And the reason the client didn't get the surgery is that it's a complicated, it was a multi level ACDF fusion that was going to involve two separate operations going in back and front. There's a lot of potential complications. If you, you, know, you talk to the doctors, talk to the clients who've had them, you know, a lot of people either regret getting it or then need a subsequent additional fusion at an adjacent level. And so I was able to get testimony from Sabin and from uh, ah. Dr. Rumley that the 3% chance per year following a fusion that you're going to need an additional fusion. Also use Sabin to talk about the potential complications from surgery. One of the things was um, sexual dysfunction being a potential yeah. consequence. And Paul and his wife were concerned about that. They they have a big family. He have four kids, but you know, they had talked about, yeah, maybe we want to have another kid someday. But those risks of the surgery and but at the end of the day, what Paul said is, and still says is, look, I think I'm probably going to need this fusion, but I'm going to put it off as long as I can. Because yep. if it's just going to put a solid piece of hardware in my back, that's going to make me less mobile. It's going to make it, it's not going to guarantee to fix my pain. And it's going to make it more likely that I'm going to need another surgery. I'm just going to deal with this until, I, until the pain is not bearable. And then I will go forward and get the fusion. And so our listeners know, what was the cost as approximately for that lumbar fusion? Just roughly, was it two to three hundred? Three, I think three fifty. Really. Yeah, that's uh, three fifty. Okay. And then my other uh, one of the things I heard you say that I just think is brilliant is using the defense expert to constructively cross them to get out stuff that's great for your case. So I heard you talking about how you were using Sabin to talk about the risks of surgery. Tell the listen, tell the listeners a little bit about the idea of using the defense experts to shore up your case. Right. I mean, as much as you can do that, right. It's, it's great. And, and part of, right. One of the issues in the case is if you need the surgery, why haven't you gotten it yet? Yeah. And yeah. Is he ever going to get the surgery and why should, why should we award the cost of a future surgery that you may never get? And so as much as I could, I wanted to build my client's credibility. And, and so going back to trial prep, you know, the, one of the things, and this is a trial by human, it, sort of everyone recommends it, but go spend time with your clients, go spend time. And, and I only had about a month, but I think we spent three, close to three full days in their, in the client's home, just hanging out, talking about trial issues, learning about him, his life, what's important to him, and asking these questions of why don't you want to get the surgery and really trying to understand his perspective. Um, this is what the risks all, you know, they're telling me I might need another one. It might not work. They're telling me it could come with all of these other potential side effects. It just didn't seem like a good idea for me to just jump into getting this fusion. 
So I'm hearing you, you know, we all here spend time with your clients, break bread with them, have time. Are you telling these listeners that that bore real fruit for you in this case? 100%. And I, you know, again, right. Like it's one of those things you hear it all the time. People say it, people say you need to do it, but man, you really need to do it. You know, <laughs> like do, seriously. Do, and, I, and what I, what I took from the trial, what I'm thinking about moving forward is some of that stuff that we all do, or we know is important to do as you're leading up to trial. How do we incorporate that earlier on in the cases? And so, you know, I, I don't, I don't, frankly, I don't spend time with every single client in a pre-suit context, um, you know, certainly not in their homes. I try to spend a lot of time talking to them and getting to know them, but I think there's, there's probably a lot of value to, before you send out a demand letter, go spend some time in the client's home and really learn what their experience is like, is you'll get some things that you may not have understood, or you may not have understood in a way that helped that you can explain it. And so, you know, for me, so examples of that here are what we were just talking about, learning about why he was worried about the surgery, then extrapolating that out to, okay, how can I use Dr. Sabin to build his credibility, to say everything that he's saying about being worried about these risks of surgery, that's all valid. These are real risks. And a lot of people don't, there's no, and I support people's decision not to rush into a multi-level spinal fusion because it's a risky surgery. And so getting the defense expert to support that, that was huge, obviously. But other things I learned spending time with the client are, you know, you talked about uh, working on cars was a real passion for him. And mm. and it's one thing to, to have a client say that to you on the phone and say, okay, yeah, you like to work on cars. I pulled up to his house and there's like five cars in the driveway. <laughs> And, and, and what was your venue? I, I know the answer to this. What's the venue? We're in Adams County. Okay. Uh, with Judge Seedorf. And I don't know if I mentioned it yet, but Kevin Ripplinger was defense counsel for State Farm in this case. Okay. And so, but so then, you know, I saw the garage where he's working on this old Civic, you know, beater that he's, that's been in there for years that his wife is pissed off at him because it's taken up the spot in the garage where they could be parked in their car. And there's, Something about sitting there with the client and hearing his wife's frustration with him that he still likes to do this, even though it's painful for him. And that that's, you know, instead of watching a soap opera Real Housewives with her at night, he's out there tinkering on the car, you know. Mm. And, and those were stories that we were then able to have both of them talk about in trial. But that I, for me, what was really important about it is that it's, it just sunk in for me. And I think, you know, part makes of what it makes it real, makes it real. A part of what, yeah. you know, it's one thing to, you know, I have a client who likes to dance and, and I, they can't dance anymore in this because of their injuries. It's one th thing to say that it's another thing to really understand what dance is for that client, what kind of release they get, what kind of, you know, personal, emotional experience that that is on the positive side before the injuries and now having that taken from them. And, you know, we're guiding the jury. I think this is another mitnickism is uh, to appraise the value of what was taken from our clients. Yeah. And, yeah. and how, you know, how can we do that unless we have a real understanding of what was taken? Um, and that's, that was something that really hit home for me. There's a, another couple anecdotes of, you know, his, while we're sitting there, the client's son, 18 year old, comes home from school and he's about to go to wrestling practice. And this was the first time that this came up was, I can't go to my son's. I, I really, I go, but I really can't enjoy my son's wrestling matches anymore because they're these full day thing and sitting on these hard benches. And it used to be something that I like to do, go socialize with the other parents, hang yeah. out all day and watch. My kid wrestle and feel feel pride and 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 watching what he's doing, but now the whole experience is just a miserable, painful thing where I'm wow pain can't sit there. Got to get up and stand up and walk around, and I don't want to talk to anybody. And and that was another thing that again I didn't have any idea about until his son. We're sitting there in the in the kitchen, and his son walks in with the wrestling bag. Of, hey, I'm going off to practice, and so that's another 
anecdote of, you know, spending time in the with the client in the client's home, you learn these kinds of things. That for me, that was that was valuable. You know, the the hey, he doesn't even want to go sit at his son's wrestling match. Like, yeah, that's not even fun for him anymore. I'll tell you one of the things that you're inspiring me with right now is that you did all of this within a month, because. I think we've all been there. I know our listeners have. We've all got cases we're working on. And it seems like it's like the six week time frame is usually when it's like, oh, this case is really going to trial. So I kind of like that you don't have to do it perfect. You just have to do it. So it can be two weeks, three weeks before trial. And you're getting all this super useful information that you're able to implement. It's very inspiring, frankly. Well, thank you. And I mean, part frankly part of that was what was nice for me and i think that that's there's value to having someone come in with a fresh set of eyes yeah a month six weeks before trial to just figure out how do we really let the narrative take shape and give a real form and structure to what we want our presentation of the case to be because i've yeah i've been there in a case that's been my case from the beginning and i'm six weeks before trial and i'm still kicking myself of, you know, is there another deposition I could have taken or could I have uh, refined an expert opinion or gotten another rebuttal opinion and, and thinking about all these things, all these could have, should have, would have, yeah. and that can cloud, cloud your judgment of, okay, how do we take what we have here and, and shine it up the best we can and, and, you know, and really, and narrow the issues, put it into a coherent, cohesive, framework that the jury can get behind and understand. And so for me, that was, you know, there was a lot, a lot of freedom to that, to coming to this case late of, look, I'm just, I'm stuck with what we have. I got to try to put it in the best pot package we can and, you know, maybe scrap some things, uh, maybe drop some claims. There was, there's this whole other aside where the client actually had a pituitary tumor that was discovered. Whoa in the imaging they did because of crash related injuries, but the, the tumor, there was maybe some thought that the crash could have accelerated the growth of the tumor, impacted the tumor. And so we, we had retained Dr. Sonstein uh, to talk about all the injuries in the case, including take a look at the tumor. And he, you know, he basically said, I, I can't get there. It's possible, but I can't, get there that it anything was caused or or exacerbated by the crash Um, sure and dr sonstein also echoed dr sabin's opinion and we had retained him as a rebuttal expert in the case uh, prior to my involvement but he basically said the same thing as dr sabin of i don't see enough evidence in the record to support dr rumley's recommendation for surgery um, wow. So he put that in a rebuttal report, in an opinion, or you're like, eh, we're yeah. not going to. Yeah. So that was, you know, one of the things I came in the case and said, okay, we're not going to call Dr. Sonstein. Um, and we're not, we're going to drop the pituitary. We're not even going to mention it because it's too convoluted. It's going to come off as reaching. There might be something there, but we don't have the opinions to support it. And so that was part of what I recommended. And what we did was narrow some of the issues we, we didn't discuss the pituitary tumor. We decided not to talk, not to call Dr. Sonstein, but Dr. Sonstein, he wanted to help us the best he could. You know, we retained him. And so we yeah, did yeah, spend yeah. a lot of time prepping with him. And one of the things that he educated me about was that, again, look, I, I don't have the evidence to support the need for surgery because he um, talked about the flexion extension x-rays that were done in the case where they are taken motion x-rays, they did not show instability in the spine. And Dr. Sonstein said, I'm not gonna do surgery unless there's instability. So I don't agree with Dr. Rumley's decision to do surgery. Uh, Dr. Rumley said, there's what we call micro instability here. And what micro instability is, it's kind of a made up term for instability you can't see. Uh, It's instability, you know, basically Dr. Rumley's saying, based on what the client's telling me, based on what I'm observing, there must be some instability here, even though it's not showing up on the imaging. And Dr. Rumley and his uh, practice, they have done surgery for people who are in a similar 
circumstance where the imaging is not showing the micro instability, but they have evidence that it's there and they've had successful outcomes. And so, but one of the things uh, Dr. Sonstein told me in prep was that, look, I don't see the evidence here, but, and I don't usually support the use of discectomies, but this is yeah. a situation where I might actually, that's something you could do. You, if you're gonna, there's no other options. He's tried the injections. We all sort of agree he's, his client's stuck with either deal with the pain or surgery, but there aren't really any other options. So Sabin said, rather than do a multi-level fusion, you could do a discectomy to try to pinpoint which level uh, need surgery if so, and, and or narrow down where you're doing the surgery. So he gave me this idea of maybe that's something else that could have been done short of surgery. And prior to trial, Kevin Ripplinger notified us that they were going to call Dr. Sonstein. Again, uh, it was clear to me they were just wanted to put him up there to say, you agree that there's not enough information here to support the recommendation for surgery, um, which this also backfired on them. And there's, we'll get back into that later, but. I'm, I'm fascinated by this, yeah. them cross designating Sonstein yeah. and then calling. So did they call Sonstein? They did. Um, and to, I, yeah, I'm dying. I'm dying. Let me, yeah, let me put that okay. on for one second. So, <laughs> all right. Um, but basically, only point being, Sonstein gave me this information. Okay, we could do a discectomy here to okay. narrow down where we need to, to do the surgery, try to further identify the problem level. Um, and with that information in prep, I was actually, didn't know this was going to happen, but I got Sabin to go there of, oh, we could try a discectomy here. And he sort of explained the whole reasoning behind that. And I, um, in preparing for the defense to call Sonstein, kind of hoped maybe I could get him to talk about that, but didn't end up being able to do that because that wasn't disclosed in his opinions and I didn't call him, but thankfully I was able to get Sabin to go there on his own about the, um, about doing a further, further evaluation. But, you know, this is another option. And one of the things that, um, okay, well, let me put a pause on that. So yeah, Rippling decides to call Sonstein. And I, I guess, you know, part of caution here is I've had, a, I've had cases where I actually, Dr. Sabin thought he was maybe our strongest witness in a, a case yeah. where he was retained by the defense, but he supported most of the injuries. And I got that case settled. But what I told the defense attorney was, my first witness is going to be your doctor that you hired. And I think Ripplinger kind of got excited that he was going to use the doctor that we hired to take down our case. And so he subpoenaed Sonstein to be there. Sonstein did not talk with him ahead of time was not happy to be subpoenaed. It was subpoenaed for the morning. And then things run late as things can happen during trial and yep. they're breaking for lunch and Sansin still hasn't been called. And he starts cursing out Ripplinger in the hallway. Like, why, <laughs> why the F did you subpoena me to be here at nine in the morning? You know, what's going on here? And it just so happened there was a juror in the hallway who heard no Sansin. Flip. Yeah, rippling her. This young girl who I kind of pegged as kind of a go along person where she wasn't going to be the leader. Uh, so the judge brought her in and we questioned her is this going to impact, you know, how you feel about this testimony or the case, the lawyers? And she said no. And she wasn't going to talk to any of the other jurors about it. So she ended up staying on the jury, but that was just like a little bit of midday excitement there. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, and, and it was clear when he called Sonstein that Sonstein was not happy to be there, a little ownery and, and, you know, short with his answers and, um, it did not, I don't think it went well for Ripplinger. I mean, he maybe sort of got the one thing he wanted, which is you don't, you agree that surgery is not supported here this recommendation for surgery but um at the end of the day i think it did not go pleasantly for him it was you know pulling teeth to just get that testimony from him and probably not worth it for what he got out of it um and something that the jurors told us afterwards but this didn't even cross my mind um was that 
they just they saw Dr. Sonstein and Dr. Sabin as these sort of old curmudgeons who are no longer really practicing, who are maybe not familiar with these newfangled surgery techniques. And and Dr. Rumley's a young guy who's uh, had military training and had only been practiced for a few years. And the jury just kind of said, he probably knows new stuff and new things that, that these old Micro guys- Micro-instability, right? Yeah, Micro-instability. Exactly, that these old- <laughs> You know, these old curmudgeons just aren't familiar with the new techniques that they're teaching in school these days. And the jury came up with that on their own. I was like, wow, that's that's great. Thank you for that. You know, um, and we we haven't I mean, we, we probably should have said this earlier, but what was the result? What was the breakdown of your verdict in this case? Yes. Um, so. So going back for a second, this was a case where at mediation before I was involved, State Farm didn't made a final offer $50,000. They stat offered okay. $50,000. What was the policy? 250 policy. Um, we set them up demand of the limits in the weeks before trial. Um, it was a, so we had uh, claims against the driver, the 17 year old, but also the parents under family car doctrine. There were also, okay. we also had a negligent entrustment claim that was not strong. So that was another recommendation that I made that we uh, withdraw that on the eve of trial defense admitted to family car doctrine. And so they took liability off the table, like on the eve of trial. And I, I didn't make a huge deal of that, but that's something that I you know you hear people talk about in terms of, okay, why are they just admitting it now? Um, but Sorry, I got sidetracked there for a second. So the result, fifty thousand dollars. The 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 final the verdict and past meds in this case were about I think ninety eight thousand. Um, and the verdict, and they offered fifty on yeah. ninety eight in meds. Thank you, State Farm. Right, right. Another reason I was thankful in this case is right. They didn't give us a choice. We had to go to trial. And this wow. is the kind of case where if they offered, you know, I started looking at the case and there were some warts when when I first. Um, got involved. There's, there's this prior injury. There's uh, some other issues with the client's treatment and a lot of chiropractic care and a lot of the things that the defense will tell us to try to get yeah. us to think badly about our cases. Had, oh, me, yeah. had me wondering, you know, this maybe this isn't a case we should be going to trial and let's see if we can get any more money and get out of it. Um, yep, yep. But thankfully, they didn't put any more money on it and they forced us to go to trial on it. Um, and at the end of the day, the jury awarded just under five million dollars uh, oh my goodness total, total verdict oh excuse me just under 3.5 million dollars with interest and costs um, added up to about five million. Oh my goodness it's just it, it's just a phenomenal result and i have found and I, I don't know if this is true with you as well but it's the best when they make the decision to go to trial easy. It's the worst when it's like, oh man, I'm, this is scary. But in this case, it's like, you don't have a choice. You go to trial and uh, what a phenomenal, phenomenal result. Do you know, um, were you able to get a significant impairment award in, yes. included in that? And, and how did you go about, what was it and what kind of tricks can the listeners take from you as to uh, how to get the money in that bucket? Yeah, so the impairment award was two point five million dollars. Oh my and, goodness! Um, I have you to thank a lot for that. Um, okay. I, I mean, I'll tell you, I so I saw it in my preparing my closing argument in the months before trial, I saw that you had posted um, about a verdict you had against Kevin Ripplinger, and you posted both your closing slides and the closing argument uh, in the trial lawyers listserv and I'm, I'm very thankful that you posted those i saved them both right away and i looked at the slides and i i said oh, i'm going to use something similar to these slides in my my next closing but it didn't hit home for me that that case was against ripplinger until the night before my closing when i pulled it back up and i'm looking at your slides and i then go read your closing argument and notice i had never paid attention to the defense counsel prior to that, you know, in looking at your uh, closing and slides, and I see that's Ripplinger, and I see in his closing 
that you included that he was using a lot of the same language that he ended up using in our trial. I recognize some phrases that he used in the closing argument in your case uh, from the opening in our case where he, he said things like, um, I want you to use logic and reasoning to give the plaintiff less than what he wants. And so I'm, I'm reading this then, then as I'm preparing my closing. And I just, I, when I read that, I, I knew I had him. It was just this feeling <laughs> of like, oh, this is it. Like we got him. Um, and I ran downstairs and I told my wife, I was so excited. I was like jumping up and down. I'm like, right, this is going to be it. We got him. And because I said to her, I was like, this is going to be my, I don't know this, if this reference will connect with people, but I was like, this is going to be my Eminem and eight mile moment. Like <clears throat> I'm going to go tell the jury about how Kevin Rick Willinger's real name is Clarence and his parents have a real nice marriage. <laughs> and, I, I get that reference. It was, uh, I know what he has to say about me going yeah. in. I mean, it was so powerful for me to feel like I knew what he was going to say before he got up there and said it. So that's why I'm so thankful for you for posting that closing. And I, my wife came and watched and some other people from our firm came and watched the closing. And I, as I'm using that phrase, the logic and reasoning and give the plaintiff less than whatever they're asking for. Uh, my wife said, I saw him just taking the pen and like crossing out stuff in his closing. There was a few really fun, you know, getting in the elevator. And Kevin and I, he's very easy to work with, professional guy. Agreed. He does a good job. Yeah. Um, I respect him. I, I had a pleasant working rapport with him throughout trial. And I got in the elevator the morning of closing. And I said, dude, you're so fucked. <laughs> I just, I... I felt it. I kind of like, I had this feeling like it was going to connect and, and yeah. you tell during the trial that we had a couple jurors, you never know exactly, but we seemed like we had a couple jurors on our side who were leaders, seemed to be leaders in, in the box there and that panned out. But so, and then, you know, a few right before I give the closing, maybe 10, 15 minutes before I put my slides on his desk and I say, Hey, this should look familiar to you. Keith Selly gave a very similar closing a oh, few months God. ago. And he goes, Oh, is this the the house and Vale and the or Hassan Aspen and the Van Gogh painting thing? And I said, It sure is. Um, and so I will get more into that, but that's setting up the impairment. He and he, you know, kind of um he had a defeated look that that he didn't know how to deal with it. And so the idea of what the what the way to set yeah, up let's give way, it let's give yeah. it to the listeners and i yeah i'd say that this the real credit of all this goes back to kevin cheney and i'm sure that he borrowed it from someone else which is the whole idea of this podcast is we just try to get this information so why don't you give your interpretation of yeah. the burning house and aspen analogy for impairment right so you know that the the idea is okay what is impairment getting back to it's we're praising the value of what was taken our client in the way of health. And so how do we figure out how much your body, your life is impaired? Well, and, and this is an uncomfortable thing. I said this and it's true. My mom used to always tell me we don't talk about money and it's not a taboo to talk about, but you have to get out in front of it and you have to talk about it. And so getting the jury very, very early on and body are comfortable with the idea of talking about money, talking about a lot of money, all that sets this up. And then what I said is, you know, what is the value? What is the, okay, here's a framework you can use to think about this. I'm not telling you this is the numbers you have to use, but here's an idea. And okay, well, let's think about what is an unimpaired human body worth? Take a five-year-old who doesn't have any injuries or prior conditions. What are they worth? So one, here's a way to think about that. The, the most expensive house to sell in Colorado last year, and I don't know if this is still true, is $50 million. Um, I had this big house in Aspen and I put up the picture of the house. Um, and so let's imagine a scenario where there's another fire going on in Aspen somewhere that day. And there's a fire breaks out at this house in Aspen and inside that house, the two homeowners, they have a five-year-old daughter and, but they get outside the house, right? And they are standing outside and there's one firefighter who's working, who's able to come to that house 
because there's another fire going on somewhere in town. And so when the firefighter gets there, the the wife says, our daughter's inside, you know, go find her. And the husband says, well, this $96 million Van Gogh painting I just purchased is also inside. You know, if you could grab that for me, that'd be great too. So the firefighter goes in the house and gets, it's dark, gets to a room. He sees the Van Gogh on the wall and he's about to grab it off the wall. And then he sees the little girl and the fire's blazing and it's getting hot in there. And he realizes I don't have, I can't, the Van Gogh's big enough. I, and the girl, I can't carry them both. And there's not time to take both of them. And so what does he do? Every single time he gets the girl out of there, right? And so the value of human life, it's worth more than that $92 million Van Gogh, right? It's worth more than that $50 million house in Aspen. Who cares if the house burns down? Um, an unimpaired human life, that's one way to look at it. It's worth at least, at least those things, right? So I took those numbers and I said, okay, let's take the $50 million house. And then said, okay, our client, Paul Daw, he's not an unimpaired human. He's 38 years old and he had this prior back injury and he had some things going on in his life. So he's, he's not a perfect specimen of health. He's not worth $50 million. He's about halfway through his life. He's got some yeah. issues. He's worth 25 million. Okay, um, I love it. And, and so, um, and on, in terms of the rating, what percentage I just yeah. made it, I made it up. So I mean, you didn't I, have an impairment rating. So Sonstein gave us a 7% impairment reading, but I couldn't get it in. And it was almost better that I didn't, um, uh, because of, because they called him and it was beyond the scope oh. of direct and yep, no one yep. else had given an impairment rating. Okay. Um, okay. and so I just said, you know, it's kind of like, if you believe it, you can say whatever you want. And yep. so I said, this is a low back injury. This is an injury that impacts every single moment of his day. The, the spine does not get any rest. Maybe when you're laying down completely, um, in bed, your spine gets a rest. But if you're sitting, standing up, your spine is active every, every part of your day. And you've heard about the injury to Paul's spine. And I'll, you know, I think that that injury is at least a 10% impairment to his overall quality of health and life. And I just threw the 10% number out there because I thought it was reasonable. I believed it. It's, it seemed fair to me. Yeah. And again, yeah. I presented it to the jury and like, you can choose a different number. This is just a way to think about it. Um, and so. The other they gave you that they gave you 10 percent of two 25 and million so here's the other thing though so dr sonstein said and and ripplinger did elicit this from him that what he said was 90 percent of paul's post-accident treatment was due to the crash yep. so but 50 percent of his condition was due to his crap injuries from the crash and 50% was due to the prior condition. And so I, in my closing, I, 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 I said, look, if Dr. Sonstein says that his ongoing condition is only 50% related to the crash. And so if you want to cut that $2.5 million impairment number in half and give us 1.125 or 1.25, yeah. um, that there's some there's support for that. That makes sense to me, basically. And and so I thought best case scenario, they were going to give us 1.25 for impairment. Wow. The jury came back and gave all of the 2.5. Um, and it was, you know, they were out, the jury was out for maybe an hour, which is scary. scary. And, I, you know, part of me was like, well, it's either we're going to lose <laughs> or yeah. they're going to give me what I asked for. And I thought best case scenario was we're going to get the 1.25 million plus our past medical and future, the future surgery. Um, yeah. But they, a great the, result. the jury said to us though, you know, we thought about it. There was the two older ladies on the, on the jury, one of them, one of the two I thought would be the four person was, and they both said afterwards, you know, he's not thinking about, he's going to have grandkids one day. He's not thinking about how, He's not going to be oh, able to pick goodness. up his grandkids. I can't imagine 
I got these two little bundles of joy and you know, so they're they're they were doing golden rule um without you know on their own basically yeah um, yeah um and they said we just thought that the 2.5 number was appropriate wow <laughs> that is unbelievable uh how many days did the trial take five really four and a half okay and uh judge seerdorf any uh comments on judge seerdorf no he was i mean I thought he was reasonable. I thought he was great. It was great. You know, the, um, I, he got a little mad at me at one point. I was trying to ask Sonstein about testimony that Saban had given about other, you know, about his opinions in the case. And I'm trying to walk, there's a sequestration order. I'm trying to ask him uh. about testimony that was given prior. And so I got, uh, snapped at by the judge, you know, once there for that, but, you know, then he's completely pleasant. I think the jury liked him. I think, I think most people who have tried cases or have been in front of him will agree. I think he's now not only doing criminal docket, so that's a, a loss for us not having him on the civil bench anymore. The the one thing that we have not talked about is uh, voir dire. Did you have a specific strategy that you employed in voir dire, or specific issues that you wanted to address? Yes. And, and how so, and how much time did you get? Did you get like thirty minutes, twenty minutes? We got 30. Um, okay. And so I, this is, I've done a couple of voir dires before, but not uh, many. And, and what I learned trying to incorporate, you know, Mitnick's cherry pie example yeah. and make that into your own example. And he, Mitnick has a really long, I think, effective way to get jurors for cause. But what I learned after trying to do that in a couple trials is there's really no time for that in 20 minutes. Like, you, you may be able to get a juror or two for cause if they present themselves quickly and you can follow up on that. But um, to go through this drawn out approach of one by one, trying to lock a juror into a cause challenge, I, I didn't have any success with that the first couple of trials where I tried that. And so what I tried to do here was really just get the jury talking. I gave a real quick, this might not be the case for you, explaining that concept. Mm -hmm. Um, and I use, I did use burden of proof and coupled that with money for pain and okay. talking about, okay. And, and I, to be frank, I didn't feel as good about the case in jury selection as I did by the time I was giving closing. And That's so, nice. so I mean, in, it's nice to have that happen. I've had yeah. the opposite many times I feel right. like, <laughs> right, right. Um, and so I think I said hundreds of thousands of dollars in jury okay. selection. We're going to be asking for hundreds of thousands of dollars. Okay. Um, and does anyone, you know, how do, how do people feel about the burden of proof in relation to an award of hundreds of thousands of dollars? And I used, and it was a time when the Broncos were really struggling. I think you, I may have seen this in your closing about crossing the 50 yard line. And uh. I added a little clip of like, you know, wouldn't it be nice if the Broncos just had to cross the 50 yard line in order to get a touchdown? Um, it's got the jury laughing a little bit on that, but, um, you know, so there was my idea for jury selection was to get the people talking as quickly as possible. And yep. they did, and they did the work for us in a lot of ways. There was one juror who really, so there was a couple who took polar opposite stances, one saying, this lady, she told a story about some a former roommate who basically made up being involved in a crash in order to try to file a lawsuit and about how she thinks plaintiff's lawyers are shysty because of this. And she yeah. could never yeah. be involved in a case like this because that turned her off completely. Now, hearing her talk, like she was very over the top. It struck me as something like she was sophisticated enough to try to use this as a way to not be on the jury and maybe she didn't really have these types of feelings as strongly as she was leading on, but she was, a, she was someone that we were able to get off her cause. And I almost hesitated, like, maybe I don't want her off because I, I kind of thought she was exaggerating how much she hated plaintiffs and plaintiffs cases. Um, but her, she was useful to just get the discussion going. Is anyone else still you know, have feelings like that? And then, <clears throat> you know, someone made a comment about, ambulance chasers and that I, I mean i 
I was able, I just said, do you think I'm an ambulance chaser? You know, does anyone think I'm an ambulance chaser that Mr. Daw shouldn't have his day in court because I might be an ambulance chaser or hmm. something, you know, and just sort of love that. Love that. that. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and got them all to say, no, no, you seem reason. Yeah. You seem fine. Like, so that was nice that they didn't say, yeah, you're a scumbag. Um, but, and, and there was another veneer person who talked about the opposite experience of being in a crash and feeling like they got really screwed over by the insurance company ah, and yep. negotiating with the insurance company. So that was nice to have that insurance discussion unprompted, um, go on. That's during, great. During selection as well. And so, and I mean, those were, I just, once that started going, I just tried to let that go and, uh, you know, get as much information as I could out of that. The one thing, you know, strategically, when it came down to picking the jury, uh, what I did and I thanked myself for later was looking at the panel and there was someone who I thought about striking who wasn't bad. It was just sort of, this is our last one, do, who do we strike? And then thinking forward to who I thought Ripplinger was going to strike, looking at who that next person in line was going to be. So the person wasn't on the panel right then, but depending on who Ripplinger decided to strike would have been. Um, yes, yes. And so that person, I like identified them as, oh, that could be a case killing person who really okay. doesn't like the case. And so even yeah. though they weren't, they potentially weren't going to be on the panel, I decided to strike that person anyways. And that ended up being, I was obviously it worked out. Brilliant. Yeah. It ended up being brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, uh, We've come to the end of our time here. Thank you so much for being on the program and inspiring us. Is there one sort of takeaway? Um, I mean, what I took away is just the importance of meeting with the clients, but is there one sort of, you know, this really, if that's what it is, great. If there's something else, what can the listeners take from your amazing experience in Adams County? I guess, and you touched on this, I think, yeah, meeting with the client, getting to know the client. I mean, Paul since has become a great, He's become a friend. I've gone to dinner with him and his wife a few times with my wow. wife. I mean, obviously that's that's not going to happen in every case, but I think Paul will be a lifelong friend for me now. And that, that's a great value to me beyond just the case. But I think meeting with the clients helps me and I, I think it help anyone connect to why we're doing what we're doing, why you're, why you're making that call to the adjuster, sending that letter, doing what might feel like a tedious, monotonous task connecting to the whys of of that you know it's a lot easier to do that when you really understand and know your client's struggle um and the other thing i'll just say is this is my first closing argument in a jury wow trial ever and, oh my goodness yeah and um and what i mean to say by that is you know and mitnick says this too like it doesn't need to be pretty it's not going to be pretty your first few times in trial you're going to be nervous, but you know, it, it, when you get back to this, I'm, I'm on the right side. This is why, why I'm right. Even though he had a prior injury, even though these other things that they try to muddy the waters, right? If you can bring it back to, okay, I have a righteous cause and I have a framework and a narrative that I put together before we got to trial that I know makes sense to me. And I think will make sense to the jury the prettiness, the extraneous factors, the presentation skills, all the things that we want to be polished to impress other lawyers. It doesn't matter as much as connecting to the client, connecting to the cause, the purpose. And that, I think, you know, that bleeds through. The jury can see that. The jury can feel that. And um, you can go and great, get great results, even if you don't have a perfect case, even if you don't have the most polished presentation. Well, what an inspiring, inspiring uh, interview. And it's been so fun to hear this. Um, and, and, you know, one of the other takeaways that I took from this is these cases happen all the time in Denver. If you think about it, it, it these types of cases are we all have them in our inventory of cases. And kudos to you for jumping in the arena and go into bat. What an amazing result. And thank you so much for appearing on the show. Thanks again. Yeah, it's been my pleasure. And we hope you continue to enjoy us. Uh, and hopefully this podcast is of value. 
That's the main thing is hopefully those of you who are listening are getting something out of it because I'll continue to do it as long as uh, I continue to get stuff out of it, which every single time I've been able to talk with folks, uh, not only is the inspiration there, but the strategy and the actual uh, uh, how to go into battle and when I feel like I get a little better every single day. So thank you again, John, for appearing and thank you all for listening. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. We hope you've gained valuable insights and inspiration from today's courtroom warriors. And thank you for being in the arena. Make sure to subscribe and join us next time as we continue to dissect real cases and learn from Colorado's top trial lawyers. Our mission is to empower our legal community, helping us to become better trial lawyers to effectively represent our clients. Keep your connection to Colorado's best trial lawyers alive at www.thectlc.com.